Salut! Eu sunt Vlad, mulțumesc pentru introducere, foarte drăguț. Uh, the world we live in today, uh, so I'm gonna do this in English. The world we live in today basically suggests that we should trust others. We should trust banks with our money, but we don't understand that when we go to the bank and deposit money, we don't, we're not actually depositing money. We're basically loaning the bank our money. So what we receive in return is a liability from the bank. So we have to trust banks to remain solvent. When you shop online, uh, many times the retailers will want to hold your cards, uh, with your credit card details. So you're also trusting online retailers with your money. In the world today, basically, you cannot have access to directly to financial markets. So you'll have to go through intermediaries. If you want to buy stocks or if you want to exchange foreign currency, you'll have to have someone do it for you. There's no direct access. And we willingly give Facebook and Google and other companies our data for free. But unfortunately, banks fail. We've seen this in Cyprus, which is a EU country, and we've seen retailers get hacked. Retailers get hacked all the time. Intermediaries usually charge large fees, and Facebook and Google openly sell our data. Basically, we should be trusting ourselves instead of trusting others. There's new technology that help us do that. It's called blockchain. Basically, today we, he, we have three ways of storing information. You have a centralized system, which basically imagine your bank. So it's a single server or a, a network of servers that hold all your data. You have to trust them that the data they store is correct. Then you have decentralized systems. So imagine like the internet, where you have servers uh, that serve the web pages that you visit every day. And then there's the model that, that blockchain uses, which is a distributed system. So basically, you have a network of nodes, a network of servers or computers that all share the same data. So every server on the network, every node, holds a copy of all the data. What this means is it allows you to verify the data locally. So you don't need to trust any other node on the network, but you can verify it independently. So basically, what's a blockchain? It's a, it's a sort of a database. It's a ledger of transactions. And Basically, the data are bundled in blocks, so similar types of data are bundled together, and they're secured through advanced cryptography. The data cannot be changed, and because you hold a copy of all the data, you can verify the data independently, so no reliance on third parties. So what can you store on a blockchain? Today, you can store payments, you can store shipping and distribution information. For example, Maersk, which is the largest shipping company in the world, is running a pilot program today to, uh, to ship products from Australia to China. And basically the issue there is that the ships once arriving in China, they'll stay there for two weeks to do their customs. Through blockchain, you can do this automatically. So you, you gain the two weeks for shipping. You can store medical, pri me medical records in a privacy setting, that's correct, for, for medical records. You can do contracts and smart contracts, and I'll discuss smart contracts in a minute here. You can store property. The country of Georgia is storing 100,000 land deeds on blockchain today. And Sweden is working on a similar solution. And you can store assets. For example, you can store um, stocks. You can store works of art on, on blockchains. So what's a block? Basically, you, you take information about a transaction. Say we have payment transactions on a network. So we bundle them together, and we, we do um, an encryption algorithm, which is called hashing. Now, what hashing does is it takes a bit of information, any information, and it gives you sort of like a unique identifier for that information. Any piece of data in that information that you change will give you a different hash, so a different identifier. So this allows you to identify pieces of data individually. And by, by identifying them individually, when you change any bit of data, you can see an attempt of fraud, for example, that, that would be very easy to identify. So let's see. Information in a block. We have the block number, which usually increases with every new block. And you have the transactions. Now, the first transaction in a blockchain that, that involves money is always the Coinbase transaction. And that is given to the miner that finds the block. I'll explain mining in a minute. And then you have other transactions. Say, uh, I'd be sending some money to my colleagues. And then you have the part about security. So this is the hashing part. Basically, what happens is all the information in this block is hashed, and you get a string of characters. 
Now, when you create a new block, you take the string of characters from the previous block, the hash, the unique identifier, and you include that in the next block. Now, by including the information in the next block, it becomes immutable. So basically, you can't change the past. So if I decided tomorrow that the money I sent to my colleagues was too much, and I decided, OK, I only want to send $40, then the hash would change, as you see in red. So with a different hash, uh, if you publish this new block, this modified block to the network, all the participants will reject it, because they already have a copy of block number three, and they'll see that you've changed something. So this is very easy to detect fraud. Now, as I was explaining, because new blocks and new data is always connected to previous data, the past remains immutable and cannot be changed. So let's talk about some blockchain implementations. We have Bitcoin, which was basically the first implementation. It was uh, invented in 2009 by anonymous, uh, an anonymous person. And it's basically open source internet money. It's fully controlled by its user. It's decentralized and it's secured through blockchain technology. It's used now for storing value and for fast payments. So mining, uh, it's basically finding very special hashes. So for Bitcoin, if you want to mine, you need to find hashes with uh, 18 leading zeros. Now this is, these are very hard to find. So you use specialized hardware, which is uh, an ASICS miner, or for other cryptocurrencies, you can use GPUs, which are basically video cards on, on your laptop or computer. Um, so trying to find these hashes means you're doing millions and millions and millions of hashes per second, trying to find one with 18 leading zeros. Now, this basically secures the network and just doesn't allow anyone to just publish blocks. So you need to, to, to work to, to build the blocks. And this is the, the security behind Bitcoin. So it's proof of work. So let's see how a Bitcoin transaction actually works. You have someone trying to send someone else money. So I'm sending some money to my colleague. Basically, I'm using my private key to sign a transaction and publish it to the network. Now, the next step is the validation step. So every blockchain has a set of rules. Every participant in the network is enforcing the rules. So every node has the list of rules in the network. So for example, a payment transaction must always contain the value, the sender, and the recipient. So they validate that I actually own the Bitcoin, that I'm a, a, a sender, and who I'm sending them to, and that, that I actually have the Bitcoin I'm trying to send. So once validated, uh, then it's included in a block. And once the next block comes along, this transaction becomes immutable. Now, Bitcoin transactions, uh, so Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network can do about 320,000 transactions per day. This is from yesterday. There were 295,000 transactions. Uh, in terms of usage, you have the largest Bitcoin wallet in the world. It's saying they have over 17 million wallets today. Now, we have other implementations. This is Ethereum. It's basically a computer on a blockchain. It allows you to run unstoppable and immutable code. So imagine you want to have an application that's banned in China, for example. Facebook is banned in China. Google, some certain Google services are also banned in China. So you could be running a decentralized application using smart contracts, which are basically bits of code that you run on the network. So when you publish a smart contract, all the participants, all the nodes in the network have a copy of the smart contract, and you can access it from anywhere, anytime. And you can tokenize things. So for example, there's a company doing uh, tokenizing works of art. So you can own, say, 1% of a very valuable piece of art. And you can do ICOs, which are uh, crowdfunding projects. So companies come up with a plan, and they say, OK, I want to build this product. And they raise money on the blockchain through the Ethereum network. So why is there so much hype with digital currencies? Well, for example, with Ethereum, you have a consortium of very large companies, including Microsoft, JP Morgan, Intel. There's about 160 companies now working with the technology behind Ethereum. So what happened is the price of Ether went from, above, uh, from about 12 euros to over 240 in two or three months. But when you have companies the size of Microsoft and JP Morgan working with this technology, you know there's something there that is worth exploring. 
So in the beginning, in 2009, the, the market for digital currencies was worth exactly zero. Today, the top 100 digital currencies are worth over 122 billion euros, with Bitcoin and Ethereum being the largest. Uh, the, the market in digital currencies is 24-7, and you have about 7.7 .7 billion per day in traded value. So like, like uh, we were saying, we're the largest digital currency exchange service in Romania with uh, over 200 million RON worth of transactions and uh, over 4,000 customers. Do you have any questions? If I were to get out of the mine, mai pot face asta astfel încât să și ies pe plus? Da, din, eu nu sunt specialist în minat, dar din ce îmi spun specialist în minat, ai un return pe an de 20-25% dacă vinzi tot ce produci. Dacă nu vinzi tot ce produci, atunci the sky's the limit cât poți să câștigi, pentru că valoarea lor poate să crească în timp. Ce recomanzi celor interesați? Să apuce de tranzacție, pe tranzacționat, sau să se apuce și de a investi în riguri și a se apuca de minat? Eu cred că minatul ar trebui, adică minatul implică cunoașterea de foarte multe informații și implică să stai să le monitorizezi aparatele pentru o perioadă îndelungată. Sunt specialiști care oferă serviciu de hosting, de aparate de minat. Eu aș recomanda să folosiți asta dacă chiar vreți să faceți mining. Pentru și trading e mai simplu, că poți să-i cumperi direct. Și ce Gata monedă să mineze? Ce monedă să mineze? Asta depinde să fac niște calcule de profitabilitate. Acum foarte mulți minează Ethereum. De asta, Întrebări dacă ați încercat să cumpărați un GPU recent, o placă grafică, ați văzut că prețul a crezut semnificativ și mai devreme, în anul, pur și simplu, nu găseai să le cumperi, pentru că erau folosite în mining. Toate. Bună ziua! Uh, eram interesată în graficul de mai devreme, era un, o mare scădere acolo. Ce reprezintă dropul ăla? Fantastic? Există volatilitate. Ca în toate piețele există volatilitate. Sigur, volatilitatea este mai mare în monedele digitale decât în piețele tradiționale. Aici vezi o creștere de la 12 euro până la 350, o corecție până la 150 și de acolo înapoi la 30. Ne puteți spune și ce a fost, care a fost cauza care a determinat scăderea aceea? A fost, sau în general, care sunt în general când ai o creștere foarte, foarte mare și foarte abruptă, urmează o corecție. Adică nu poate să meargă parabolic în sus tot timpul. Este nevoie ca în toate piețele financiare de corecții, de resetare de poziții. Este normal. Acum, sigur, volatilitatea este mai mare în monede digitale decât în monede tradiționale. Uh, salut! Am o întrebare. Uh, ai vorbit foarte mult despre imutabilitatea tranzacțiilor. Uh, pe de altă parte, la începutul prezentării, uh, ne-ai spus despre Ethereum și Ethereum Classic. Uh, poți să ne spui un pic uh, ceva despre fork și despre dacă asta nu este împotriva principiului uh, imutabilității? Sigur. Uh, în principiu, uh, într-un blockchain, tu ai... Uh, mă rog, în, într-o rețea blockchain, tu ai uh, niște noduri și nodurile toate trebuie să fie de acord pe regulile care sunt în rețea. Și atunci, în momentul în care cineva vrea să schimbe regulile sau nu mai este de acord cu regulile actuale, atunci, practic, se întâmplă un split în blockchain. Blockchain-ul se împarte în două rețele separate. Asta s-a întâmplat, de exemplu, în Bitcoin, în 1 august, s-a făcut un upgrade pe protocol ca să permită mai multe tranzacții. O parte din rețea n-a fost de acord cu acest upgrade și acum există Bitcoin Classic. Pe Ethereum, la fel, a fost un hack, unul dintre dintre acele aplicații, sau mă rog, prima aplicație mare a fost secuită, s-au furat niște bani și o parte din rețea a decis că ar fi bine ca acel hack să fie revertit, adică să nu mai existe, ca banii să se întoarcă înapoi la utilizator. O par cealaltă parte din rețea a spus că nu și atunci s-a întâmplat tot așa un split. Mulțumim mult!